Good afternoon, this is Marshall Davis. If there is a common theme among people who reach out to me, it is that they have outgrown the religion that they used to be a part of. Some of us were brought up in the church, others converted to what evangelicals call being born again. For some people, those are one and the same. They were brought up in a strict fundamentalist, evangelical, or Roman Catholic religion, and at some point came to embrace it personally. And for a while, that type of religion seemed to work. But at some point, we noticed the cracks in the facade. It no longer made sense. And we began to question the things that we once believed. Personally, I went through a series of these outgrowings during my life. From the traditional mainline Protestantism of my youth, to teenage atheism, to evangelical Christianity, and then progressive Christianity, and then to a form of conservative reformed theology, and then on to a radical skepticism. Every one of us who have been on a spiritual journey can tell a story like this about our lives. Each of our stories is unique to our own circumstances. When I was at the end of my rope, when I had deconstructed everything I had ever believed and came to the conclusion that there was no religion or philosophy or spiritual worldview that was true, no doctrine that was anything more than an idea in the mind, no imaginary friend in the sky, that is when grace came. That is when spiritual awakening happened. The inside became the outside, the individual dissolved in the universal. The, the separate self was seen to be non-existent. All was seen as one. And I saw and see as the one. Everything that I had read in the writings of the mystics, both East and West, was verified in first-hand experience. All that seemingly paradoxical and cryptic language made sense. Furthermore, Jesus' words were now seen as pointing to this non-dual reality that he called the kingdom of God. I also saw that this had always been the case, always been true. I just hadn't noticed it. This direct apprehension of the holy, the divine, the presence of God is what all religion points to. It is what all adherents of all religions, I think, hunger and thirst for is what Jesus called the living water that wells up from within us and yet is also all around us that we swim in this reality, this unitive reality, like fish swim in the ocean. thing is it's so close that most people don't even notice it or see it. This is what people in the pews hunger and thirst for, I think, at least some of them. People want something more from church than what they are being offered. They want to grow spiritually. The letter to the Ephesians speaks of growing up into Christ. The author, traditionally understood as the Apostle Paul, says, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Christ himself, who is the head. I recently entitled an episode, you are Christ. We grow up into Christ. Even though from an eternal perspective there's no such thing as growth, looking at this from a relative perspective, growth seems to be happening. So it can be a helpful metaphor. For that reason, growth and lack of it is a theme in Scripture and the anonymous letter to the Hebrews the author, who I think from the content is, is a 
is a former priest, a Sadducee, who became a follower of Jesus. He scolds his readers. He says this. He says, in fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, he says, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and our faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so, he says. That's the end of the quote. Now, you read that, but you listen to what most Christian sermons are saying, especially evangelical sermons, is exactly what this author in Hebrews describes as milk. Elementary teachings about Christ to use Hebrews' words, a focus on repentance from dead works, faith in God, baptism and resurrection and judgment and things like that. It's no wonder that Christians who have to sit there in the pew year after year and decade after decade do not grow. They are being fed milk and not solid food. On the other hand, the gospel of Jesus, which is the non-dual kingdom of God is solid food. Jesus fed solid food. And that's why so many traditional Christians today choke on it. They can't handle it. They're not used to it. They're used to milk or pre-chewed or strained baby food spoon-fed from the pulpit. But I have found there are always some people in the churches who are hungry for more than preacherly pablum. That's why I still preach from pulpits as well as do these talks on Christian non-duality online. Some Christians want to grow and they should not have to leave the church to grow. Now, in talking about growth, I'm using a metaphor here, and I'm using that because Jesus uses metaphor or not. But we have to realize it's just a metaphor. Spiritual awakening can equally be described as a sudden realization of what has always been true. And Jesus actually uses both of these images in his teachings about the kingdom of God. So it's kind of similar to the scientific understanding of light being a wave or a particle. You know, science through experiments says that it acts like both. Jesus described the kingdom of God as both growing, but also a sudden breaking in of awareness of God's presence. So you can do either way, but today I'm going to be talking about growth. Jesus said the kingdom of God was like a tiny mustard seed that grew into the largest of all the shrubs, he said. He told another parable of the growing seed, saying that the kingdom of God was like a man scattering seed, which then grows into a harvest, although the farmer does not understand how it happens. You know, realization, awakening happens, but we don't understand how it happens. Most famously, Jesus told the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower explains why spiritual awakening seems to be so rare. Jesus describes a farmer who, strove, who sows extravagantly, just as Jesus sowed his gospel of the kingdom extravagantly. He throws the seed everywhere on hard trampled ground, on the rocky shallow soil, on soil with lots of weeds in it, as well as on soft, deep soil. The seed was all the same, but it only took root, grew to maturity and bore fruit in conducive soil. Only a small percentage of seeds ever bear fruit. Likewise, only a small percentage of people spiritually wake up. Why? It's just the way of the universe. 
I mean, how many planets have produced life? What percentage do you think? Extremely small, I imagine. Every farm or even an amateur vegetable gardener like me knows that germination rates of seeds is not 100%, even when the seeds are all planted in good soil. When planted in bad soil, they don't even have a chance. Even the vast majority of seeds grown in good soil do not make it. Many, probably most, never even sprout for some reason. You know, I've planted a whole row of a certain vegetable and have hardly have had hard any hardly any come up and I have to have to replant the whole row. And when some when they do sprout, then you inevitably have to thin them out, a lot of them, most of them, the majority of them, if not eighty or ninety percent of them, in order to give the survivor space for growth. And then disease takes them, or frost takes them, or drought, or rot from too much rain, or insects eat them, or animals eat them. Every garden knows this. They also know that of all the seeds sown, very few plants reach maturity and produce fruit, and therefore seeds of their own. It's the same with the animal kingdom. That's the way evolution is in nature. How many eggs grow to maturity and reproduce? How many of a litter grow to maturity? A small percentage. It's the same with the kingdom of God. Think of the thousands that Jesus preached to during his ministry. All types of people. Jesus preached to Pharisees and Sadducees and, and scribes and he preached to uh, Pilate, Roman governor, and Herod, the king of the Jews, and the high priest, and tax collectors, and prostitutes, and social outcasts, and those labeled by religious society as sinners, all types of people. But how many devoted followers did he have? A dozen. And how many of them really got it? The Gospels say over and over and over again that they didn't get it. Even the one that seemed to get it, Peter, really didn't get it. You know, there's very, very few. That's how I see the religion of all types today, including the Christian religion. Hardly any churches today even proclaim what Jesus proclaimed. Proclaim the message of the kingdom of God. Instead, they preach a message about Jesus that was that was developed over over the centuries. 99.9% .9 preach and teach secondhand religious tradition that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God that Jesus was talking about. Only a small percentage wake up in and to the reality of the kingdom of God that I tend to call unitive awareness or non-dual awareness. For those that do, it's not because of anything they have done or we have done. You know, we or they are not any better than anyone else. It's all a matter of grace. And when you read and hear Jesus' parable, parables, it's all about grace. There's nothing that the seed can do or that the soil can do in the parable of the sower to change what it is and change the outcome. You know, I have heard, and if you go to church, I'm sure you have heard the parable of the sower preach where the, the, the preacher basically says to his hearers, you got to be good soil. <laughs> soil can't do anything. Dirt can't change. In the parable of the lost sheep, there's nothing the sheep did or can do to be found. Same with the parable of the lost coin. Nothing the coin did to be found by the woman. Same even with the lost son when we really understand that parable of the prodigal son and the older brother correctly. It's not about what we do. It's all about grace. Most religious people are not even looking for, for this. 
for this reality that I'm talking about here. They're not looking for anything more than what they've always done and always heard. And they're content with that. Not, more, not only content, but they resent anyone who challenges it. Anyone who is looking for something more. And many of them warn you. To say, they say beware of straying from the beaten path of churchianity. Yet in the parable of the sower, the beaten path bore no fruit. Those seeds did not even germinate. But if you're listening to this, then the seed has found good soil. If you are listening to this, you are seeking out more than milk, and you are already growing. You are hungry for more than what the letter to the Hebrews calls the elementary teachings of repentance and faith and, and baptism. So don't be discouraged. Growth is happening. Persevere. The kingdom of God will appear in its own time. And when it does, it will be seen that the kingdom has always been here now. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in our midst and it is within us. And that is it for today. Grace and peace to you.